Well, in province after province and in the House of Commons, the debate over whether Canada should have a legal framework for physician-assisted death is taking place on many fronts. Joining us now for their perspectives. In St. John's, Newfoundland, via Skype, Susan McDonald, President of the Canadian Society of Palliative Care Physicians. In the nation's capital, via Skype, Stephen Fletcher, Conservative Member of Parliament for the riding of Charleswood, St. James, Assiniboia and Headingley, and with us here in our studio. James Downer, Co-Chair of the Physicians Advisory Committee, Dying with Dignity, and Quam McKenzie, Medical Director at CAMH, the Centre for Addiction and Mental Health. Welcome to all of you, Quam. Welcome back to the program. Let me begin with you, Quam, and I want to talk about the DSM, the Diagnostics uh, and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, in, which is in its fifth edition. Um, it's kind of the so-called Bible of the medical world. It made some changes uh, with regards to suicide. What were the changes in it? Well, it talks about uh, suicide slightly differently in that uh, it uh, moved um, suicidal thoughts and suicidal ideation from the main part of the DSM into some, uh, uh, an area that was uh, needed for further study and part of that was to really get more information on uh, suicidal ideation and what suicidal ideation means uh, for mental health problems. And why is it important to, to have a, a designation for suicide? Well, suicide itself is a, um, a coroner's verdict. It's not, it's not a, an actual uh, diagnosis uh, per se. It's a, it's, a, it's a coroner's verdict. And suicidal thoughts and suicidal ideation are symptoms, and they can be symptoms of many different mental health problems. And because of that, you've, you've got to be careful in how you think of them. Some people think of suicide as it's not a disease, so to speak. It's not a disease you're going to treat. It's a symptom, and it can be a symptom of many different problems. And a lot of people think about suicide at some time, and often it's not uh, because they have a mental health problem. Okay, we're talking about this issue on many fronts. And Stephen, I'll come to you in just a minute on the political front. I want to remind our audience that they can be part of this conversation. The Agenda is hosting a Twitter chat right now, and you can join in using the hashtag AgendaTVO and share your thoughts on tonight's topic. Stephen Fletcher, you ha there are two uh, <coughs> private members' bills that you've introduced in the House of Commons, um, and they don't use the word suicide. You prefer to use the phrase physician-assisted death. Why? Well, it's for the simple reason that the word suicide has a lot of baggage uh, with it, and it's not uh, really what the bills are focused on. The bills are focused on people who are in situations uh, probably at the end of their lives that are suffering and do not have the ability to end their own lives, so they need the assistance of someone uh, I think it should be a physician, and that physician will um, would be allowed to um, help an individual with, who is competent and an adult and a Canadian citizen to end their their lives. And there's all sorts of caveats in my, in in the legislation uh, and safeguards. Um, but at the end of the day, it's my belief that um, a person's fate. Um, is up to the person. And uh, the second bill that you refer to is really a data collection bill to ensure for best practices and so on. We have people killing themselves all throughout uh, Canada in nursing homes and other ways, you know, starving themselves to death and, and or the morphine drip is increased uh, a little bit more than, than uh, uh, Normal. It's, it, it, it's not the Canadian way, I don't think. The Supreme Court, even at the Supreme Court, uh, both sides admitted that the status quo, the way the law is, which is 14 years, um, up to 14 years, no ifs and buts if you help someone die. Uh, even the Supreme uh, people on all sides agreed that the status quo leads to suffering and also leads to people dying before it's their time, i.e. they kill themselves before they lose the ability to do it themselves. Okay, this is an issue we are grappling with um, as a country. Um, 
right now. But of course, it, it we've been grappling with it for a long time. And I just want to take a step back and go back, you know, 20 more than 20 years um, when Sue Rodriguez attempted to convince the courts, the country, the federal government to allow physician-assisted death. Let's just take a look at this. Crowded into a tight little corner of her lawyer's office, Sue Rodriguez once again faced a wall of cameras, microphones, and reporters to express her weary disappointment at the court's decision. I'm feeling um, discouraged, but I feel strongly that um, terminally ill people who are mentally competent should have the cho choice of time uh, as to when to die and so Basically, the court has ruled that there's no such thing as a legal right to die, okay. and therefore the law against assisted suicide does not violate the rights of Sue Rodriguez. Okay, James Downer, that's uh, from 1992. Mm -hmm. Just what's changed in the last 22 years that might lead to a different outcome in the Supreme Court of Canada as they face this issue again? Well, there's a few things that have changed in the past 20 years. At the time, there was actually already a, a significant majority of Canadians who supported the legalization of physician-assisted death. But that majority has dramatically grown. And in the most recent polls, as you alluded to, 84% of Canadians uh, support legalization of assisted death. And this cuts across every demographic group identifiable. There's actually not one group where they were able to show that, that there wasn't a majority support for legalization. Um, so that's what's changed. The large basis of the decision of the Supreme Court at that time was based on fears for the vulnerable and fears for the impact on, on end-of-life care as a whole for legalizing assisted death. At that time, there was no place in the world that had legal assisted death, and so we didn't actually have any data about what would happen. There were very, I think, legitimate concerns about uh, would there be threats to the vulnerable, would there be a deterioration of palliative care and end-of-life care in general. Um, so we didn't know what would happen. What's changed dramatically since then, of course, is that we now have data. There are more than 10 jurisdictions that have legalized assisted death, many in Europe and, and in North America, using different frameworks. Um, but they, they tend to show pretty much the same thing, that this remains an option taken by a very tiny minority of people, uh, largely, you know, essentially for the stated purpose of the bill, um, and that the effect on palliative care has not been noticeable. In fact, the, the jurisdictions that have legalized assisted death are national and international leaders in uh, a variety of palliative care metrics in the availability of palliative care. Um, and certainly the, when you do studies of, of the vulnerable populations within those societies, it, they are actually far less likely than the average person to receive an assisted death um, than, than a, a person mm. without disabilities or, or somebody who is not uh, a member of a vulnerable population would be. So I think we have a lot more data than we used to have um, that suggests that it actually could be safe, that, that there are fears, these slippery slopes that people talked about, uh, none of them sort of panned out at all. I wanna, we're going to talk more about the slippery slope <clears> argument, because <throat> there is a, a lot of that. I'll come back to you, Kwame, in just a minute. But uh, Susan, let me ask you, because James talks about end of life and palliative care in Canada. Since Sue Rodriguez, since, since the early 90s, just put this in context for us, what has changed in terms of end of life care? Well, I think there's been a few things that, that have particularly changed. One is that our ability to manage symptoms um, is far better than it used to be 20 years ago when I first trained as a palliative care physician. So I think we're much better at symptom management um, and that palliative care is also um, much more embraced um, as a both as a discipline and as something that other healthcare professionals want a part of. I also think that the population, uh, the general population of Canada, has a much better sense of what palliative care is. Now, there's certainly a lot of work to do. Um, people still may think of us as, as purely an end-of-life type service, but I, I think we have made significant strides, and, and things certainly have moved forward in the last 20 years. Well, I think things have moved forward with palliative care. And I think that um, some of the countries that have uh, allowed physician-assisted suicide are leaders in palliative care, but they're leaders in lots of other things as well. And it's actually quite difficult to compare one country to another over time. We don't actually know exactly where this is going. It looks like in the early days of physician-assisted suicide, it hasn't uh, dramatically changed the way the healthcare has been run and there hasn't been 
uh, huge amounts of take up. But just in the last 10, 15, 20 years, there's been a significant change in the percentage of people in Canada who've said, yeah, we're actually we're for physician-assisted suicide. So I think you've got to be very careful in saying, okay, well, over the last 10, 15 years, this has happened in various places across the world, hasn't led to a big explosion of people wanting physician-assisted suicide, hasn't changed how we're running our healthcare system. Well, that was then. The question is what would happen now? And we don't really know exactly what would happen now. Well, let me ask you this, because as, as Susan ex you know, says, there have been advances in palliative care. Um, what about the psychological challenges? Because that, that's, that's your area of expertise. Um, have the advances in palliative care changed the psychological challenges uh, of dealing um, with people who are terminally ill who may choose to, to, to have a physician-assisted death? I think that one of the things I've seen in palliative care is palliative care are um, and palliative care specialists are fabulous at including the psychological side to people. In fact, better than some uh, psychiatrists at times. And so I think this idea of holistic care and also care not only of the individual but of their family and others has been something that's been very important in palliative care. When funded properly, Palliative care, I think, is, is really important. And as, as Susan was saying, starting early and thinking not just right at the end of life, but thinking about palliative care earlier is important. And yes, it does produce some challenges uh, from the psychological perspective. You know, there are uh, sort of treatments like cognitive behavioral therapy, a certain type of uh, therapy for depression, which works quite well in palliative care but then some of the challenges is getting hold of it. Uh, there are questions about when it is reasonable to be sad and to be negative about the future because you have a terminal illness, and when that is actually depression and trying to disentangle those are important things. And then there's a question about the impact on staff because palliative care staff often, you know, they have emotions about uh, how they deal with loss over and over again and what should team support look like so the sort of how you deal and how uh, psychiatrists and psychologists work with palliative care is a very important area and a growing area mm. of study and as we untangle this and, and struggle as a country to figure out what's going on, I think one thing we, need, we just need to clarify and Stephen I'll come to you this about what the, the legal situation in Canada is right now on uh, in November of 2014 what is the laws, the legislation, the current legal situation as it pertains to physician-assisted death in our country? Well, in, in, in the criminal code, section 241, uh, says two, th two interesting things. One, it explicitly says suicide is legal. Uh, but it, then it goes on to say to assist someone to commit suicide is illegal and punishable up to 14 years in jail and um it, it this is being challenged in front of the courts at present it was heard about three weeks ago uh, at the supreme court very similar case to the rodriguez case i have uh, a couple of private members bills and i'm going to soon introduce them into the Senate uh, to try and fast track them through the parliamentary process. But uh, the fact is none of the uh, uh, parties, uh, NDP, Liberals or Conservatives, are keen to take this issue up and uh, have really uh, left it up to the courts to make uh, the decision if the criminal code is is um, constitutional or not. And James, this is particularly resonating in Quebec and British Columbia. Walk us through what's happening there. Well, I, I, I would say that um, I, I, I would disagree that it's just resonating in Quebec and British Columbia. Um, it's resonating across the country. As, as I said, the, there is no identifiable demographic that does not strongly support the legalization of assisted death, be it geographic, economic, religious, gender. Um, it just doesn't there. Um, 
I think the the fundamental issue at play here is is really a, um, that in our society we have had a long-standing tension between sort of what are maybe uh, termed traditional values and beliefs about what should be and what shouldn't be. Um, these come from a Judeo-Christian ethic and a mindset, and that we're slowly sort of seeing that come up against a more autonomous type, you know, uh, belief where people should have freedom of choice and do what they, they feel. So we see that issue playing out with um, homosexuality in the 60s being, being decriminalized. We see that playing out with uh, abortion and then same-sex marriage and now uh, assisted death. That these are all issues where the same these are all issues where the same two the same tension was taking place, and I, I think you're seeing an evolution, a process where slowly we are giving giving uh, uh, transitioning from these more traditional values to values that embrace the primacy, at least, of, of autonomy, of freedom of choice. So I think people are becoming more empowered, people are becoming more aware of issues, and people are wanting to have control over. There's a cultural shift going on. I, absolutely, but but I think it probably. One of the things that I was interested in is the question that people were asked. When people say 87% of people agree with physician-assisted suicide, if I remember rightly, the question was, um, do you agree with physician-assisted suicide if the person is, unbear feel, is suffering unbearably, uh, terminally ill, and they ask repeatedly for for uh, somebody to to uh, to kill them. Yes. So, so the term the, the the question, which again was posed by Epsos Reed, so these were yeah. these were professional methodologists coming up with the question, asked uh, more or less exactly the scenario described in Bill Fifty Two, yeah. and asked if a, somebody were to uh, give assistance to somebody to die, should they be charged with a crime? So it was not using any. It was trying to avoid the use of a loaded term or any sort of leading language. Unlike previous polls that may have used terms like euthanasia, assisted suicide, etc., yeah. it described a specific scenario, a specific action, and said, should this person face crimes for that? 84% said no. But that was with terminal illness, unbearable suffering, and repeated questions. In other words, the legislation being proposed in Quebec, yeah. yes. So it's, again, a, a relevant question I think exactly a, the way it was asked. I think it's a good question. I totally agree with you. It's just that it is very specific about what people are talking about, mm. yeah. Okay, Susan, let me come to you. Where, where does the Canadian Society of Palliative Care Physicians stand on this issue? Do you, what's the official stance? Well, it, it's interesting. We, of course, we, we don't speak for, uh, the society doesn't speak for every palliative care physician, and we certainly have people like James who are on one end of the spectrum, and we have people who are at the other. But we did a poll back in 2010 of our membership, and we had almost 50% of the membership reply to the poll. And we were very specific about the questions we asked. We, we asked, do you think it should be legalized? both assisted suicide and euthanasia, and and the vast majority of our respondents said no. But was even more uh, impressive, I guess, with the numbers of palliative care physicians who felt very uncomfortable and, and said they would not participate in um, providing assisted suicide themselves or providing euthanasia themselves. I think it, it gets to the heart of what it is that we do as, as clinicians, and many uh, of our membership feel quite strongly that one of the the issues that people often are fearful about coming to palliative care is they there's this this feeling or they've heard rumors that that in fact we we end people's life prematurely and we just heard one of one of uh, the panelists speak about you know turning up the morphine just a bit too much. Um, and when that's the general consensus among the public that that it's that assisted suicide and euthanasia are already happening clandestinely and against the law, um, it's really hard for patients to trust that their clinician will not do that. Um, and so, most palliative care physicians currently feel that that euthanasia or assisted suicide really isn't a part of palliative care, that it's something separate, and that we, uh, our job is to help people with the emotional, physical, uh, psychological suffering that occurs when you have uh, um, a life-threatening condition, but that the, the piece of suicide or, or assisted suicide or euthanasia would be something quite separate. So the, the, the majority of our membership, and I'm talking 85 to 90 percent, 
are, are not in favor at this time. I want you just, uh, because language is important here, Susan, mm. and just make the differentiate between assisted suicide and euthanasia, because in order to have this debate right. in a fulsome nature, we need to understand the differences between these right. terms. Right, and there's and it's, it's actually quite a significant difference. Assisted suicide is where an individual, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a physician, provides the means for the, for the patient to end their own life. So either a prescription is given or med, you know, medication, probably medication would be given. Um, so that, but the patient themselves administers the drug. So they swallow it or inject it themselves or they do something. Euthanasia is um, a little bit more complicated because you are in, you are, uh, in some ways, the patient is almost forcing an individual to be complicit in, in their own death. So in euthanasia, somebody has to actually, somebody else other than the patient actually has to push the injection or, or, or uh, make them swallow the pill or something, you know, whatever, it, uh, whatever method they're choosing to, to do it with. So, so a lot of people feel quite strongly about the difference. They, you know, they might be a little bit more comfortable with uh, an assisted suicide because it's the, again, it's the patient being autonomous and doing it on their own as opposed to um, being told or or have to do it themselves. Okay, I want to I want I want to introduce something else that happened this summer, and this happened in the social media world in, in the fall, actually, uh, when the debate over dying with dignity re really flared um, with Brittany Maynard, who's a 29-year-old um, with brain cancer, and she took her situation public via YouTube. Take a listen to this. I don't wake up every day and look at it. <laughs> Um, it's in a safe spot, and I know that it's there when I need it. I plan to be surrounded by my immediate family, which is my husband and my mother and my stepfather and my best friend, who's also a physician, um, and probably not much more people. Um, and I will die upstairs in my bedroom that I share with my husband, um, with my mother and my husband by my side. and pass peacefully with some music that I like in the background. Between, you know, suffering or being allowed to decide when enough is enough, um, it just, to me, makes, uh, it provides a lot of relief and, and um, comfort that, okay, that option is there if and when we decide and, or she decides that you know, it's time. And uh, Brittany decided it was time, James, on, on November 1st. Um, that's when she died. Um, how has her death changed the discussion around this topic? Well, uh, Brittany Maynard, I think, was w the latest in a long string of, of very public cases of people who put a, bit, a face on this issue. Um, it, it, as we say, you know, you can discuss it in an abstract sense, but here's somebody telling you, a 29 year old, you, a young person who, you know, looks to most of the world to be quite healthy. When you hear her speak, she uh, is, seems to be a very rational um, person, you know, seems to be competent to make a decision. She's making a clear request and does not seem to, you know, she'll, she'll say herself, look, I'm not depressed. There's not one ounce of me that's depressed. Um, I'm, I'm not suicidal, but I'm dying and this is how I would prefer to die. I, I think that gets at some of the core issues here, which is that when you see somebody like Don Lowe or Brittany Maynard explain their rationale behind doing this, that it, it, it really is about control and about cir controlling the circumstances of death. And I think Dr. McDonald made some very important points about what physicians may be concerned about in all of this, that you know, um, when you talk about physician-assisted death, meaning euthanasia, or sometimes even assisted suicide, that, that involving a physician or having a physician involved in it, that you're, you're bringing another person into it. Mm. Um, and you saw a dramatic shift in the past year in the CMA's position on this. The Canadian Medical Association initially was strongly opposed. This summer, they had another annual general meeting where they quite significantly moved their position to one that is more neutral. But what the position was very clear, saying, look, you follow your conscience within the within the the standards of the law, which is very different than opposition, which is to say that really physician interests in this very much center around uh, concern that physicians may have a moral objection to it, a personal objection to it, and that they should not be forced to participate in anything they don't want. 
I would argue that that interest can be served by the right of conscientious objection and refusal, which is enshrined in, in uh, Bill 52 and, and uh, Mr. Fletcher's legislation, that physicians are not obliged to participate. From my own perspective, I, I certainly don't feel comfortable with the idea of, of myself or anyone, any other physician necessarily participating in an assisted death. I don't like that idea. But I like even less the idea that this person would die suffering in a way that they don't want, and that would be unnecessary, right? Like my, uh, that I, I feel like my desire for controlling my actions um, is can be served by uh, without necessarily impinging upon somebody else's rights to to act according to their conscience. Stephen, let me bring you back in here. <coughs> when you're hearing um, what James and, and Susan are saying from from a physician's approach, and then add into that uh, Brittany's story. H how does that inform where you stand on all of this? Well, I, it just reinforces, uh, I think, what I've been saying when I, since I've introduced the bills. Uh, and in regard to uh, what was said earlier uh, by one of the panel members, it's just not anyone providing the assistance, the the bill and the subheading on this show, it, it's very clear we're talking about physician assisted death, not uh, Joe Blow assisted death. Um, and I think that's very important uh, to recognize. The In regard to uh, people in this day and age, um, we are experiencing things that we've never experienced in human history before people are living longer uh, with uh, technology that never existed before. An ALS uh, sufferer like Sue Rodriguez, the last stages of that process is literally drowning in your own phlegm. You know, and I've been there after my accident, that left me a quadriplegic. And that is a, a terrible feeling to have that drowning feeling. There's no medication in the world that can help with that. Um, and you just sort of gasp from breath to breath, uh, moment after moment, uh, week after week, and it's terrible. And it, I was getting better, but if I was going the other way, I wouldn't want to uh, have to deal with that longer than I, than I had to. Um, but right now, the, the law forces people to suffer, and needlessly. And that's not right. Okay, I want to introduce someone else into this, and that's the Pope, because um, this past weekend he was addressing the Association of Italian Catholic Doctors, and he took the opportunity to speak out on this issue. Here's what uh, some of what the Pope said. He said, uh, the Pope considers the assisted suicide movement as a symptom of a contemporary throwaway culture that views the sick and elderly as a drain on society. Francis, during this meeting, urged doctors to take quote, a courageous and against the grain decisions to uphold church teaching on the dignity of life. That was uh, published in The Telegraph um, by Nick Squires. James, when we look at Canadian Catholics, you, you've, made, you, you've said that there wasn't, you know, a lot of demarcations between the different demographics, but what did the Ipsos Reed poll tell us about the attitudes of Canadian Catholics on so, this issue? So uh, Catholics were 83% in favour of legalising assisted death. 83%. 83%. It's interesting that, you know, because Pope Francis is quite uh, well recognized for being somebody who's very forward thinking on a lot of social issues and has been a lot more open to things than maybe some of his predecessors have. I, I don't presume to give the Pope instruction, but the, the Pope himself <laughs> has recognized that the church teaching is largely out of step with, with the vast majority of beliefs of members of the Catholic Church, and they are currently uh, a, a changing their approach to planned family, to talking about sex education, to a variety of social topics, simply out of recognition of the fact that, that the official church position is just not even represented among Catholics, let alone the population And, and Quinn, what does it say to you that, you know, there seems to be some universe, universality around this issue in Canada, that we're not seeing it, you know, um, break down on sort of tradition, cultural or religious lines? Well, I was born a Catholic and I, I listen to everything the Pope says. <laughs> uh, but I think what he's saying and what he said there isn't in line with what people were asked here. People were asked a very specific question. They were asked about people who were terminally ill, who were suffering unbearably and who wanted to end their lives. And I think that is something very different. That is not uh, uh, anything to do with a throwaway culture that doesn't take any 
uh, um, care with the meaning of life. That's something different. And I think if you ask almost anybody that sort of question, you you know you'll you'll get the the results you get because but you seem to be hinting yeah. that that you don't uh, believe that this large proportion this large majority of Canadians actually supports physician assisted death. You're no 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 I I do I apologise if that's the the uh, ex what what it seems like I said I think they do support it in very demarcated uh, conditions, um, but I think that sometimes what happens with the discussion is we start very demarcated, unbearable suffering, terminally ill, uh, competent to make a decision and ask them repeatedly to end their lives. And then we, we get some, we, it starts to get bigger and bigger and then we're saying that there are other groups who can make the same sort of decisions and you know, what about people with uh, chronic mental illness, what about people with chronic physical conditions who aren't terminally ill? And, and then it starts expanding. Mm. And I think when it starts expanding, then I think it gets more fuzzy very quickly. Can I just jump in on that? Because actually, there, um, it, it's good that you brought that up, Kwame. In the the Epsos Read poll actually did include a number of other scenarios as questions. Um, and in fact, of the response, virtually every scenario still had a majority support, including situations like the ones you just described. So, yeah, the, the level certainly went down for it went other down indications. to about 60%. It, in it some went into them. the 60s. It went into the 60s. And that's where you start getting significant differences between groups, different groups. If I could jump in on that point as well. Uh, you know, when I was putting the legislation together, I obviously went uh, and did some uh, discussions with various stakeholder groups, including uh, the religious community. Uh, and I did a round table um, in, uh, in Winnipeg with uh, the Christian community, you know, Protestants right across the spectrum and, uh, and Catholics. And while, you know, the Protestants were generally in favor, as you might expect, or maybe not, but but what really shocked me was that um, the Catholic father, when I when it came to him, he said he supported uh, physician-assisted death, and I I was well, doctor, you're not really pulling the party line on that, and his reply was, most of his ministry is bedside. Uh, palliative care and a life ministry and he's seen so much suffering that he cannot imagine that that is God's will. That says a lot. Let me go to Susan because I know you wanted Susan then I'll come back to the table here. Susan go ahead. These yeah. guys are fighting to talk. <laughs> yeah um, I'm just too far away. Um, <laughs> One of the things we've been talking about a lot is is suffering, and I'm certainly not an, an expert on the nature of suffering. And it, but a couple of things come to mind when when we're talking about this. And um, I've mentioned that we do have better symptom management than we ever did before. But one of the things that concerns me is that that so many patients across our country don't have access to specialized palliative care services. Um, and you know, the, one of the, the statistics that keeps being quoted is that only 30% of Canadians have access to specialized palliative care. And I think that's one of, one of the, the drivers, perhaps, uh, of this of this feeling of well, we have to have assisted suicide or euthanasia is because people are suffering and, and they don't have access to the kinds of services that, that could quite likely be of significant help. I think the other thing is that we, we really need to have a, a significant change in the attitude in, uh, of healthcare providers. Just because we're able to do something doesn't mean we should do something. And there's a whole movement about choosing, called the Choosing Wisely program, and James would, would know about this, where decisions about what kinds of treatments we ought to have are being thrown out so that that people can think a little bit more clearly about making correct choices. Should I have that surgery? Should I have a feeding tube put in? What are the consequences of doing that? I would hope that, that as we move forward, one of the silver linings out of this whole discussion about assisted suicide 
is that the general public starts to think a little bit more carefully and questions their clinicians about the treatments that they're being offered. Really, should I have that fourth line chemotherapy? What are the benefits from it? What are the downsides of it? Um, what, what will I get out of it? Should I, should I really have that, that, uh, that treatment, f that surgery or whatever? Um, those kinds of things really need to start happening a little bit more Clem, you want to say something? Yeah, I wanted to. I was, I was interested in what Susan was saying about context uh, because, you know, a lot of people say they agree with physician in assisted suicide, but behind that, I'm, I'm not sure that I understand why. Why has it gone up over the last 10, 15 years? And you can imagine that in a, a society where people are increasingly isolated, where families are increasingly broken, where there's less social cohesion, and where there's less of a social safety net, that people will be worried about being a burden on people. And people, and especially if there's not good palliative care, people will worry about when the time comes that they're not going to get um, the pain relief that they need. They're not going to get the social support that they need. And they're going to be worried about being a burden on other people and that could change the percentage of people who are talking about physician assisted suicide. But the question is whether that means you should be doing physician assisted suicide or whether you should be thinking about a more balanced approach uh, which includes uh, developing the social structures and the palliative care structures to make sure everybody gets what they need. I'm very sympathetic to physician-assisted suicide if people want it, um, but I'm worried that there are so many other things that we're not doing right that might change the equation. Hmm. I, I think the, the, the points raised by, by both Kwame and Susan are, are really important here. I think that if you ask among supporters of assisted death, every single one of them would also be a very strong supporter of increased funding and, and support for palliative care, me included. I am a palliative care physician. When I'm not in talking about this issue, I, my day job is that I take care of people and provide palliative care. I think that um, one, one message I would like to get across is that it, um, these two should not be viewed as opposites. Like it, it should not be a choice between either we legalize assisted death or we improve support for palliative care, not both. Um, I think the experience from other jurisdictions has shown that not only can you, can you do both, but in fact that, that both can be done very effectively, and Belgium and Netherlands have really shown an excellent model in that regard, that um, legalization of assisted death, and Oregon did this as well, coupled with massive increases in funding for palliative care, has, has shown the two growing. The other thing is not to say that patients necessarily come to, the, come to a point in their life where they have a crossroads and they say, well, either I'm going to take palliative care or I'm going to take assisted death. If you look at the data from Oregon, it shows that patients who have received an assisted death, um, you know, more than 90% were enrolled in a hospice program prior to selecting assisted death. So, um, you know, there certainly are situations where um, even the best palliative care is not sufficient to meet the needs of some people. I think b being a, the feeling of being a burden is a really important one. And we try very hard, obviously, to, to make sure that people are not, you know, this, this I don't, I would feel very badly if people were choosing an assisted death because they feel that they would be a burden. The, the data, again, from Oregon is quite instructive in the sense that it shows that the motivations for people choosing assisted death is not the feeling of being a burden. Predominantly, it is about control. It is about concerns about what the future might look like for them. But, but the, in terms of being a burden to family members and others, that rate's very, very mm. low on their list. Okay, we've got about 15 minutes left. I want to introduce one more thing. And, and it has to do with Miriam Taves, the author. So over the past few weeks, um, she, her latest novel, All My Puny Stories, has um, won the, the Rogers Writers Trust Fiction Prize. Kwame, you were at that, I think, that oh, dinner. Um, and it finished as, as a runner-up uh, for The Giller. Um, let me play a clip from the book first, and then we'll talk about it. All My Puny Sorrows by Miriam Taves focuses on two very close and loving sisters who are dealing with depression, mental illness, and suicide. Elfrida is, um, is older, very sophisticated, very um, elegant, very accomplished. And Yoli doesn't have any of those. Her life is a bit of a mess. She's, you know, divorced. She's just struggling trying to raise her kids. The book is about, essentially, Elf um, wanting, to, wanting to die, wanting to... Um, she, she's suffered from depression, from mental illness, from despair, from existential angst, whatever you want to call it, uh, most of her life. And Yoli is trying desperately to keep her alive. And at some point in the book, Yoli realizes that perhaps that's not um, the true loving gesture. 
All right, so the brain is an organ that's made to solve problems. So if the problem is life and its unlivability, then a rational working brain would choose to end it, no? I didn't know what to do. It felt like someone was throwing darts at the side of my head, five seconds apart. You must want to live. You have to live. That's your one imperative, the single rule of the universe. Okay, Quam. I mean, this is a, this is Mir uh, Miriam Taves talking about this, but it raises some interesting issues and what she writes about and her own personal experience. We are used to hearing um, that a cancer patient has a terminal illness. Is it possible to say that a patient's mental condition is terminal? Not usually. And some people would say not ever. Uh, most mental illnesses are treatable. Uh, if you can't necessarily cure them, you can at least make them better. And you can move people from the edge of despair to being able to function and live in their lives. That's usually what happens. Um, there are rare cases of very intractable uh, mental health problems, but that's not usually what happens. Uh, I can't think of a case in and I've worked on um, high dependency wards, in outpatients, in various countries, and I haven't, can't think of a case that I have dealt with where somebody was really totally incurable. Mm. Um, now that might be that I've had a good run of things, or it might be that I've tried to avoid difficult cases. <laughs> uh, neither in my mind. Uh, we've usually tried to, we've usually got people better. Um, you know, back 100%, not always, um, but we've usually got people better, so that's why we're, you know, you'll find most psychiatrists don't think of uh, mental illnesses as terminal illnesses at all. Susan, um, is there, in, in the world of palliative care, I mean, is there care designed palliative-wise um, for a patient like Miriam Taves' character, um, Elfrida, who doesn't have a physical ailment, but who can't, you know, face continuing her life? Is it, what's the reality of that situation? Well, I, palliative care really started mostly in the oncology world, um, and for many places, my own clinical practice is included, um, that still is the vast majority of patients that I see. Um, I actually have difficulty getting uh, consults from uh, respirology or cardiology. Um, so, and I haven't seen uh, clinically any patient referred to me or my service when it, the diagnosis has been a psychiatric illness. Um, but certainly patients who've had other medical conditions have also had a, a psychiatric condition um, that we have looked after. The nature of suffering, you know, suffering is a very personalized thing um, and it's very hard to quantify and we're usually a little bit better with being able to rate things like pain on a scale of one to ten, but again pain is very, very personal. And, so measuring somebody's depression or uh, emotional pain um, is a little bit more complicated. And I don't think overall we're as good at it um, as we would like to be. Uh, certainly as time moves forward, we, I would expect that our profession will be better at managing those kinds of symptoms um, as we are in managing things like pain and shortness of breath. Um, but to answer your question, um, generally, it hasn't been my experience, and I, and I don't know anybody who's really looked after anybody um, for a terminal condition of depression. Hmm. So I think it, about 25% of people who uh, take their lives have actually seen a psychiatrist or a family uh, practitioner in the last um, in the last year. That's generally about. Sometimes it, in some countries it goes up to 50%, but usually the majority haven't. And in Canada maybe there are 3,800 suicides a year. So there's a lot of suicide. There are more suicides than car accidents in Canada. Um, so there are a lot of people who may have very, very uh, intractable illness who aren't seeing a psychiatrist, so that could happen. In the UK, when I was in the UK, there would be, they would try psychosurgery, old-fashioned psychosurgery, 
for people who were really considered incurable. And there were whole stages that you'd have to go through to, for people to say, well, everything has been tried, every treatment we've tried, and you have a, an incurable mental health problem, and therefore you can try this very, very risky treatment, which is having brain surgery. And they would have sometimes two or three or four people a year coming through out of a population of 50 million. So that's, the, that's what the figures were mm. there. Um, are there people with mental health problems who are chronically ill? Yes. Are there people who are often suicidal? Yes. And you no, know, do we always get everybody better? No. Do we get people a bit better usually? But um, chronically you know, ill, not terminally ill. Chronically Sorry. ill, not terminally ill. Okay. James, you want to say something? Well, you know, I think it's important. To, it's a good subject to talk about a mental illness as, as a problem. Is, is this, how does this fit into a framework if, if assisted suicide or assisted death, I should say, is legal in, in Canada? I don't think that, I think it's important not to lose sight of, of what is the bigger picture, that even where men, uh, you know, people can receive an assisted death for uh, depression, as, as can be done in, in Europe, um, still you see that the vast majority of cases it is for um, diseases like cancer and stage heart disease, et cetera. Diseases that are not mental illnesses, mm. but, but actually physical illnesses. Uh, I don't, sorry, I didn't mean to contrast and say that, that mental illness was, was somehow a lesser of a condition. I, I don't mean that at all. I think it's important to, to remember that most people with mental illness retain capacity. So that in people who are terminally ill for other reasons, and they may have depression, but they are still often very, they're very often decisionally capable. I think it's important to be careful not to restrict the rights of people to or, or treat them differently because they have mental illness, thus assume that they would not should not be receiving an assisted death for terminal illness uh, of another type. Okay, Stephen, um, I want to come to uh, your bill, uh, C-581, <coughs> and I just want to read the specific wording and part of your bill. Here's what it says. In order to be eligible to make a request for physician-assisted death, a person must, and one of the things is, have been diagnosed by a physician as having an illness, a disease, or a disability, including disability arising from traumatic injury, that causes physical or psychological suffering that is intolerable to that person and that cannot be alleviated by any medical treatment acceptable to that person. As you see your bill, does the language allow for, you know, Miriam Tay's character, someone like that, Elfrida, to make a request for physician-assisted death? I will answer the question, but later on in the bill, it also says that if you make the request, it pushes you into a, a whole... Uh, set of other functions to make sure that any individual has the resources or has access or is aware of the resources that are available, be it uh, you know home care, hospice care, palliative care, or psychological care, uh, and so on. My bill, uh, I think what you're alluding to is that it is, it is broad. And I did that deliberately because what I wanted to do is bring something into Parliament that could be debated. That could be, uh, if you imagine the legislation being a, a, a marble block and having everyone sort of chip away uh, uh, at it to uh, deal with each kind of concern and, and uh, include as many people uh, as possible in that uh, in that process. Quebec has done an outstanding job uh, in the consultation process in, the, in their bill. The problem is that their bill is uh, a pro in provincial jurisdiction. The federal stuff is federal jurisdiction and the federal criminal code will trump the Quebec legislation. So there's gonna be a, a huge mess uh, uh, down the road. Um, politically, unless we can uh, sort it out here in Parliament. Uh, the courts are probably going to make the decision for all of us anyway, which is I have a problem with that as well. Um, but the legislation, um, I am absolutely open to amendments. Uh, you'll see that when it goes to the Senate, the legislation will be slightly different. Uh, again, because we just want to get it in front of a parliamentary committee. 
so that people can the elected representatives can discuss this issue it's not a partisan issue it's an issue that affects every individual you know it liberal you know NDP ears and conservatives and liberals we all we all die except the liberals may have a ghost problem but other than that we all we all pass on and we all have loved ones and it's in this venue where I am the Parliament of Canada that I think the law should be made it should not be decided by unelected judges down the street at the Supreme Court okay you have an issue with the courts deciding this one the case that was heard at the Supreme Court in mid-October is again examining the issue on on human rights grounds as it did in Sue Rodriguez back in 1992 we have about five minutes left and I just really want to get everyone in on this one Susan let me start with you I mean do you think the outcome will be different this time around I think it might be um, I'm not an expert in the law but um, I, I certainly do notice that there's a there's a change in the public feeling on this this topic and I think it, the really important thing is regardless of what the the law comes out with and and whatever changes are made is that we're having a we're having a discussion about end of life and we're talking openly about what's really important for each and every one of us. As Steve says, he's absolutely right. We all die. We all need to be talking and thinking about what's going to be right for us, whether it's, whether it's assisted suicide or whether it's not. Um, and we need to have a voice and the, the overall system needs to provide assistance and care for us when we all get to that point. Quam, what do you think? you think the outcome is going to be this different this time around? I really don't know. Mm. I don't know whether the outcome will be different. I think that people will be persuaded by the experience in other countries. And I think that people will then weigh up the fact that 85 to 85 percent of palliative care physicians are not in favour of physician-assisted suicide. So I think it's going to be a difficult one. I don't know which way it will go. Stephen, what are your hopes uh, out of the, the court case? What do you think will happen? I think the uh, court will throw uh, throw the the law, give the government a year to come up with something uh, that is not uh, a prohibition, and within three years there will be uh, a physician-assisted death uh, will be legal in Canada. And that will occur, and not to be partisan about it, but under a conservative government. <laughs> <laughs> Had to get that in there. He's an optimist. Well, an optimist is an I was going to say, in the coming year, there'll be an election, and then we may find that one of the, our national political parties may need end-of-life care at that point. But I think the, the courts, um, I, I, it's important to recognize that the Supreme Court of Canada has the ability to strike down a law. It does not have the ability to write a law. So regardless of what the court decides, I, I, I think, like, like Mr. Fletcher, um, based on the court, based on the comments of the judges during the hearing, uh, I, I'm cautiously optimistic that that the law will be struck down. Mm. But that's such a small part of what needs to be yeah, done and to then improve what? a comprehensive range of end yeah, of life yeah. care for options for Canadians. So you know, the, the, so for example, take the analogy of, of abortion. When abortion was legalized in Canada, it was not legalized by law. Mm. It was legalized. Supreme Court struck down the law. The government of the day could not pass a bill uh, establishing a legal framework. And physicians and colleges across the medical colleges across the country were left scrambling with very little time to come up with a framework work under which to operate. This is very suboptimal for, for, you know, I don't think any physician would want to go through that again with this issue because we've all just talked about all the necessary things that you need to do. The, the Supreme Court cannot order more funding for palliative care. It cannot create a comprehensive framework. It cannot put safeguards and oversight in place. So those are things that we can only do as, as, a, you know, as a society through our elected, in, uh, our elected officials. And that's why it needs to be more than just an act of Supreme Court. I want to thank um, all four of you. This is an important discussion for us to be talking about and for offering your expertise and your views on this. Appreciate um, all of your insight tonight. Thank you, all four of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Susan McDonald, President of Canadian Society of Palliative Care Physicians. Stephen Fletcher is an MP for Charleswood St. James, Assiniboia, and Headingland. Here with me in studio, Dr. James Downer, co-chair of the Physicians Advisory Committee, Dying with Dignity, 
as well as a palliative care physician with the University Health Network, and Quam McKenzie, a medical director at the, at, the Canadian, at the Centre for Addiction and Mental Health here in Toronto. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.